please remain standing as we honor the word of the Lord. I'm reading, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24, 26. And it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before your presence today. And God, we, we not only welcome you here amongst us, God, we call upon you to, to bless us today. God, we call upon you to pour your word into our hearts. God, I pray, I pray for those of us who, who are dealing with things right now, anything in our hearts that is hindering us from hearing your word, God, we command in the name of Jesus Christ, we command the forces of evil to leave us alone so we can sit here with our minds focused on you and your word and what you are going to do here. God, you are going to bring transformation. Lord Jesus, we believe in you today and we call you and we welcome you. And God, speak to us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, guys. So we are concluding our series called Worship. For the past four weeks, we have been in this series called Worship. And, and this series has, has been really dear to my heart. Um, I love this series because throughout this series, I was able, God gave me so many different revelations through this series. And and God really spoke to me through, through what I was able to, to bring to you guys through this series. And, and I got to tell you, um, as a pastor, as, as a person who started um, being in ministry as a young, in a young age, I have had a rule for myself. I had to set a rule for myself. Um, and that rule in, in regards to teaching and preaching and leading a Bible study, because I've been, I've been um, leading Bible studies and things like that for a while now. And I've had to set a rule for myself. And when I tell you this rule, though, you realize that this rule does not apply in circumstances where I'm put on the spot, okay? But, but I have said this rule for myself that every time I have the opportunity to prepare for a lesson, prepare for a sermon, prepare for a message, uh, for a Bible study, I will not bring that teaching or lead that study unless what I'm going to teach or preach about has already impacted my life. In other words, it needs to have worked in me before it can work in you. That's the only way I can be excited about it to bring the message to you. And this series has been just like that for me. I, I am kind of sad that it's ending, but at the same time, I know that we are starting a good series next week called Soul Quake, and, and we're going to talk about how the Spirit of God is going to shake our whole existence for the next four weeks. So I hope you come for that and, and allow God to speak to you through that. But in this series, um, as we finish it all, we're going to talk about worshiping God without holding back. And as I said, God has been giving me revelations upon revelations about in, in, this, in this series. In fact, here's what I want you to do. Would you take your notes and, and write the word revelation? It's not in your notes, but write the word revelation. Circle it multiple times because today I believe that God wants to give you a revelation. So in fact, touch your neighbor say, God is going to give you a revelation today. So... So I was sitting this week, I was getting ready, it was, my wife had to go to a dental appointment at, um, at 7 o'clock or so, she had to leave to go to a dent dental appointment, so I was sitting in my chair and, and my, I ha she asked me to take my daughter to school, my daughter is 6, she's going to be 7 in November, so I'm getting her ready to go to school, I, she's getting ready and I say, hey Lydia Lynn, please put, up, put on your shoes so you, we're ready to, to get in the car, so she comes and stands in the middle of the room just like this, and she stands like this, and looks around, and says, I can't find my shoes. I said, please look for it. And she looks around again. I can't find my shoes. And then she gets irritated. I can't find my shoes. I can't find my shoes anywhere. She keeps shouting, shouting, shouting and yelling. I can't find my shoes anywhere. They're nowhere, nowhere. And finally, you know, I don't know if, if as parents you, you ever reach, in those, uh, reach to those unholy moments in your life where, <laughs> where you want to strangle your kid, but you hold because the Spirit of God is keeping you from... So I lost it. I lost it. I said, Lady Ellen, you can't stand in the same spot and say that you can't find your shoes if you're not walking around and looking for it. It's not going to magically appear. Exact words. And then she walked around and found her shoes behind the couch. She came back. She's like, I found them. 
And then immediately, this is, immediately, I had a revelation from God. Because what I had just told her was something that I needed to hear myself. And I, I started thinking about this. How often is it that we as Christians, as, as people who say we are followers of Jesus, are standing in the same spot from the moment we gave our lives to Christ. We are standing in the same spot and we are shouting to God, I cannot find anybody to share the gospel with. I cannot find anybody to pray for me. I cannot find anybody who understands what I'm going through. How often are we in the same spot as we began our journey? And that is because we have never received a revelation. I believe, I believe that worshiping God without holding back means that you ceaselessly seek for revelations from God. You ceaselessly look for God to give you revelations because if you are not looking for revelations, then you are standing in the same spot and you're not moving around and you're holding back from what God has already blessed you with. You're holding back from the things that God has given you to be used for His purpose and for His glory. So this morning, as we talk about revelations, I want you to understand how important it is for you. I'm not talking about the book of Revelation, but I'm talking about the revelations that God gives you to bring you change, to bring you a newness in your life. So, so this morning, as we talk about revelations, if you go back to Matthew chapter 16, then it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And I know that many people look at this passage, and there's so many different interpretations that come from it. Some people say, you know what, my cross that I carry is, is, is when my car died the other day, and I had to go to work. And man, I couldn't start, so I had to walk. Can you see how heavy that cross was? See, if that's the cross you think was carrying, if, if you think that's what it means to carry your cross, you're wrong in that. But some other people look at it as, as you know, um, the cross that I'm carrying is that I need to be ready to suffer for my faith. I need to be ready to die for my faith. And that's a, that's a good interpretation. There's nothing wrong with that. I believe that to be true, that we are supposed to suffer for our faith. I believe that we are supposed to be willing to die for our faith. But what if... See, I also believe this. I believe that the Word of God has one definite interpretation, but every once in a while, the Spirit of God opens up the Word to you in a manner that is relevant to the transformation that is needed for your life. Okay? So every once in a while, God gives you a revelation through His Word that, that really coincides with, with something that you really need to change in your life. How many of you have had those moments you have read the passage of Scripture and like all of a sudden, you're, whoa, I just have been wrong about this my whole life. So this, this passage could be one of those passages as we talk about it, because whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. And I believe that maybe it means for some of us that we got to be willing to die for our faith. Maybe we're supposed to be welcoming persecution. But what if, what if we're not understanding the part of this revelation properly? So what is a revelation? Let's talk about the word revelation itself. Let's talk about its definition. What is a revelation first? The explanation of a revelation is that a revelation always from God always starts with three stages, okay? A revelation starts with a concept, okay? God gives you a concept. He first presents you with, with something, some sort of information that is essential to the revelation to take place. And the concept in our, in our I just want to use this passage here because this is where we're on. But whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. It's not that follow me or take up the cross. The concept is whoever wants to be my disciple. That's the concept, okay? So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus... And if you want this passage to be a revelational, a revelation-based passage for you, then you have to understand the concept is if you want to be a disciple, okay? So that's the concept. The second stage of a revelation is God gives you expectations, okay? Expectations with an end result in mind. So the expectation comes, whoever wants to be my disciple was the concept, okay? That's the general idea. Must deny themselves. That's the one expectation. Take up the cross. Second um, expectation and follow me third expectation so what is the end result the end result comes verse verse 25 for for whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever wants to lose their life will say will find it that's the end result that you cannot save your own life God is the only one who can so that so then you have the ex, the expectations there you have the concept okay there is the problem most Christians are stuck with either the concept or the expectation that's why they are stuck in the same spot, because it has never gotten to its last stage. It has never moved forward. So that's why some Christians become so um, knowledgeable. And I say Christians, so many people become so knowledgeable about God's Word. They know God's Word in their hearts, in and out. But it has never become a revelation for them. 
There are so many people who also know God's word because they know the expectations. And as they know the expectations, God's word has become a legalistic perspective for them. So they look at you, oh, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong. It becomes a legalistic thing for them because it has not become a revelation. Because the last stage is essential for a revelation to be taking place. And the last stage is transformative application. If you get the concept and you get the expectation but you do nothing about it, that means that it has not been a revelation. It means that it has not done anything to your life. So it has just been information or it's just been expectation. Because a revelation is information that leads to expectation with an end result in mind. Then it eventually leads to transformative application of the same thing because it is a revelation, okay? So in other words, let's, let's look at it a different way. So whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me, okay? So we have the concept, we have the expectation, okay? And now how does this become a revelation? Now let's look at it. You've got to ask God. That's why I said you need to ceaselessly look for God to give you a revelation. This is a, God, this is a revelation God gave me this week and I'm hoping that, that God opens it up for you as well. So from within this story, we know that a little while later... Jesus is, is, is doing communion with his, um, doing the Last Supper with his disciples. And after that, he's, he goes to the Garden of um, Gethsemane, and then he's arrested. Then he's condemned to be crucified. Then he's sentenced to death. Then, then he dies on the cross. So we know the story, right? But here's the thing. So before all that, he's, so he's, he's condemned. He's being beaten. He's being persecuted. He's being flogged. He's, they're putting a crown of thorns on his head. And they're calling the fake king, the king of the Jews. They're giving him all these things. But something that we miss in the midst of it all is that in Luke chapter 23, verse 26 says, Jesus was so bruised and beaten, okay, that he's walking and he's going to be crucified. But this is what it says. It says, as the soldiers led him away, they ceased. Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Is the revelation. Most of us look at a passage, whoever wants to be my disciple, take up the cross, follow me, deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me, right? Most of us say to ourselves, well, well it means that I got to be ready to die for Jesus. I got to be ready to do this. I got to be ready to do that. When they took Simon and put the cross on him, the cross of Jesus became Simon's. But then at the end, who died on that cross? Jesus died. See, when it says, take up your cross and follow me, you may look at it from many different ways, but that cross is the representation of every sin, every guilt, every shame, every wrongdoing that you have ever done in your life. And that cross is the representation that your life is condemned to eternal punishment and you're only deserving of the wrath of God. You're only deserving to die. But then every time you take up your cross and you follow Jesus, who dies at the end? See, at the end, Jesus dies on the cross for you. But what you do is you take up your cross and you follow him. And see, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be persecuted because as soon as you take up your cross, the whole world is going to see that you start following Jesus. The whole world is going to tell you, you know, that's not where you're supposed to go. You are supposed to be dying on that cross. You're supposed to be, be going to hell for that cross. You're supposed to die on that cross. So you're carrying this cross. But then at the end, you're being persecuted. You're being tortured. And all those things are happening. But then Jesus still ends up dying for you. At the end, he always dies on that cross. If you are following him now now if you do it the other way around see i believe you can still take up your cross but not follow jesus but when you take up your cross then you die on it and you don't follow jesus because you will the cross is the condemnation that you will receive the cross is what you are deserving of whoever wants to save their life will lose it now let's look at it from a different perspective now. So God gives you revelations. This was a sample of a revelation. God gives you revelations and these revelations open up the scripture to you. These revelations are things that you're seeking for. These revelations change you, transform you into a new being. Now go to Acts chapter 5. At this point, um, Jesus has already been resurrected. At this point, the disciples are working really hard to share the gospel because they understand that, that, that sharing the gospel is what they're there for. They believe in the power of Jesus, and it says that they're not, they're, the great numbers are being added to them on a daily basis. So people are coming to Christ on a daily basis. But then it also says that people are not just standing in the same spot and saying, I, I can't find anybody to share the gospel with. Where are these people I've got to talk to about Jesus? 
So they're not standing in the same spot. They're moving around because they have received the revelation from God, right? They have seen that Jesus has been resurrected. They have seen Jesus go on, on the cloud. And they have seen the Spirit of God come down upon them. So they have received the revelation. So they're going around and sharing the gospel, right? And then the people who are being added to them, they're also receiving the same revelations. And it says, chapter 4 says that the people are selling everything that they own to make sure that the gospel is being preached and the people are hearing the message of Jesus Christ. So that's chapter 4. So people are giving everything. They're not holding back nothing. They're not holding back anything, okay? Uh, how many of us can say that? We, oftentimes we are holding back. So chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back, he held back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the feet of the apostles. Now, at first glance, there's nothing wrong with what he's done. I mean, if you just read that from the context, the concept, right? The concept of a revelation, if you just read, there's nothing wrong with it. He had a property, he sold it, kept half of it in his pocket, brought the rest of it and said, here's the money to be used for the preaching of the gospel. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. Revelations lead to convictions from the Spirit of God, such as stopping your attempts of mocking God or deceiving God. See, there's so many of us, even in this room, there are some of, some of you that God has gifted with some of the most amazing gifts. Maybe, maybe just, just for example, maybe you're one of the greatest musicians ever. And what you do with it is you give to God maybe an hour of that talent that God has blessed you with to just make sure that nobody can judge you for it. Or just to make sure that I'm giving to God something. But God has given you a gift. God has given, blessed you with a gift Maybe, maybe, maybe for you it's wealth. Maybe you're wealthy enough. God has blessed you with wealth. And what you're saying, yeah, I'm, giving, I'm giving my monthly thing to God and that's what I'm gonna, all, all I'm going to do. We subconsciously often mock God with the gifts that He has given us because we are holding back. We stand there. Say, this is all I got. See, at the first glance, it doesn't look wrong at all. But when you, when you realize that you are deceiving God with what He has already gifted you, then things change, perspective changes, revelation takes place, right? And then watch this, it says, Then Peter said to Ananias, How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such thing? Why, why would you want to be a hypocrite? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Now, I, I often wonder when I read this, why is it that two things I always wonder when I, about this passage, why is it that, that the apostles are so bold that the Spirit tells them, you have, kept, you have held back from God. You have lied. You have tried to mock. You have tried to, to deceive the Spirit of God. Why is it that, that you can do it? Why is it that they can be so bold? And the other thing is, why is the death part of it here, why, was that necessary? Was it necessary for an eye to just fall, drop dead? So I always thought about that. And one of the things that hit me was a revelation that God gave me was that revelations that come from the Spirit of God give you the conviction such as this, that you're supposed to live every day. As Jesus is coming back the next. That's what the disciples did. That's what made them different than the other people. See, they live, see, most of us today, we live our lives as, ah, Jesus may come back in 10 years or may come back in 100 years. Most of us, that's what we live. But if we change that perspective, if it became a revelation that Jesus could be coming back because Scripture says he's coming like a thief. If he comes back right now, are you ready? Let me ask you this. Are you ready for Jesus to take you today? If he comes back right now, are you ready for the presence of Are you ready for what he's bringing? Are you ready for it? Or, or are you still waiting for a thousand years for him to come? Because if you lived your life as he's coming back today or tomorrow, then your life would completely look different. You would not hold back. You would not hold back. And, and then the death part is necessary because God brings correction to his church. Let's watch this. It says, about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me. Is this the price? Look at the boldness right there, right? Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? 
Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband at the door are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Why did they need to die? Because I believe, see, revelations that come from the Spirit of God eventually lead to convictions from the Spirit of God, such as this, that, that you know, okay, such as knowing, such as knowing that God will correct His church at any cost. That God, God will bring correction, correction to His church at any cost. And if you don't believe me on that, He who did not hold back His own Son, okay, he did not hold back his own son and sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins. And you think, see, sometimes we are so dumb. We think that we can mock God with what he has given us and stand right there and say, God, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't, want, I don't understand why my prayers are not being answered. I don't know why, what's going on with my life. Sometimes we are so dumb to ourselves to think that God will not bring correction if we stand in front of his church, if we stand in his way. God will not take God will, will bring correction at any cost. And I want you to remember that. This, this is not a message to bring you condemnation whatsoever, okay? It's not about you feeling that you're guilty about yourself. But it's about understanding that God will correct His church because He sent His only Son to die on the cross and He did not hold back because He loves us so much. And if He does not hold His Son, if you stand in, his way, in the way of His church, He's going to bring correction. So I know many people worry about the political things and this and that. God will bring correction. But you as followers of Jesus, make sure you are on the right track. See, so many people tell me the death part of this, this, this person, the lady, and, and Ananias and Sapphira. So many people say, well, so many people say, are you not afraid of dying? I mean, death was some of the things that people feared for. People still today are afraid of dying. And as a follower of Jesus, I, I am not afraid of dying. In fact, as a Middle Eastern man, I have faced death many times. I've lived through bombings, through shootings, through... You name it. I'm not afraid of dying, but here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of dying today and being before the throne of God and looking at Jesus face to face, knowing that I stood in the same spot and I held back, knowing that I could have done more. See, I'm afraid of, of being in heaven before Him and looking down from heaven and looking at hundreds of people from, from heaven that I have had the opportunity to share the gospel with and that God could have given those people an opportunity to know the gospel and, and find salvation through me. God could have used me, but I have held back. See, I am afraid of that. I am afraid to be before the throne of God knowing that I have not been growing in my faith, knowing that I have been holding back from God. And you may look at me and say, Nasser, you're wrong in that. You may look at me and say, Nasser, you're wrong because when you go to heaven, heaven is a place where there's no sorrow, there's no pain, there's only joy. And you're right, but I am not in heaven, am I? And my only perception of heaven is based on my limited knowledge of what I know about earth. And right now, I am in a place where there is sorrow. And right now, I am in a place where there is pain. And I have the opportunity to let the revelations of God seek into my heart, sink into my heart as I seek them. I know that He can bring correction. I know that through me, He can bring His redemptive message. See, Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, For I received from the Lord, but I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. See, within this passage, you've given a concept. There's the body of Jesus. There's the blood of Jesus. 
and then you have given an expectation within that passage whenever you de de whenever you take this bread and whenever you drink this cup you're, you're doing this in remembrance of me because the end result is this the end result of the expectation is that for whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes so you're proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ so you have the so you have the information right you have the the concept you have the information then you have the expectation within it but where when does this become a revelation in your heart because most of us Christians see in a minute we're gonna we're gonna partake in communion we're gonna together we're gonna celebrate the Lord's Supper together okay as a church because that's what that's a sacrament that we are commanded by Jesus to do as his church as his body to remember what he has done for us but but when does this become a revelation of why I do this why do I do this he says, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. See, it becomes a revelation when you look at this. And when you say to yourself, have I been holding back? How many times, let me ask you this, how many times have you come and partaken in, in communion? You have taken the elements, but yet you have not been carrying the cross. How many times have you been carrying, carrying your weights, your things, your, your desires, and you have come before God? There has been unforgiveness in your heart. There has been sins that you just have moved on and still continue on living in. How many times have you come and done this because it has never been a revelation for you because you have never allowed the words of God to sink in your heart that whenever you take this bread and you eat this, this, this you take this bread and you, you take this cup, whenever you do this, you are allowing God to live inside of you and you're proclaiming that you are carrying the cross because Jesus is dying on the cross and as you're doing this, your life is singing a song and this is what it sounds like. I have decided to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. See, when you take the cup and you take the bread. You are declaring to the whole world that I have decided to not turn back. I have decided to follow Jesus. And when you come and you partake in this, and that is not the declaration that your life is making, you're not only mocking God, you're not only deceiving yourself, you're not only not carrying the cross behind Jesus, but you're carrying the cross of condemnation. But you're also not allowing the revelation of God to work in your hearts. Matthew 16 again says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world? It forfeit their soul. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? But listen this, For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. This is not a message of me telling you that you are saved by the things you do. No, this is the message of me telling you that the revelation is that when you carry the cross, Jesus dies on it for you. This is the message of you understanding that Jesus Christ at the end dies on the cross for your sins. But if you are carrying that cross, the reward at the end would be eternal life because Jesus took the punishment. But if you are carrying that cross to save your own life, you will lose it because you are not carrying that cross because you are following Jesus. You are carrying that cross to be 
be a hypocrite. And as followers of Jesus, this is not what God calls us to be. We are carrying that cross to proclaim His death and His resurrection, to proclaim that there is only life in Jesus Christ and nowhere else, and to proclaim that He has taken away every sin, every guilt, everything that I was deserving of because I have now a cross behind me that I am dragging its faith and it represents the shame, the guilt, everything that I was condemned for, but yet He is still gets nailed on that cross for me and that's what it means to receive a revelation and to take the bread and the wine let's pray together Lord Jesus we come before you God prepare our hearts for this moment this is a sacred moment God coming before you and and just saying that you have died and given your body for us coming before you and say that you have shed your blood so I can find salvation so I can find redemption so I can find purification from my sins God this is a holy moment because I am not deserving of it no no one in this room is deserving of it God we are all people who, who are only deserving of wrath we are all people who are only deserving to die on that cross and, and to be a spectacle a, a sign of shame but you have taken that away by revealing yourself Lord Jesus, as we participate in this, I pray that the hearts that are not ready would know that they can stop. God, I pray for those who, who, who are struggling with things in their lives and sins that, that are just, they're not willing to give to you, God, as they come forward to participate in this. God, I pray, I pray that they can lay aside, they can lay aside the hypocrisy, the mocking, the things that are not from you and, and just give it all before you, put it all, throw it out before your throne, saying that, God, I am willing to be renewed today by you. Wash us clean today, Jesus, in your holy name I pray.